This is the debrief for the week of July 16th, 2018, and I am your co-host. My name is Seth Ressler. I'm Becky Scarcello. And I'm Jag. All right, we got an exciting show for everybody today. Lots uh, of goodies. Yeah, this really is. Um, we have Bailey Sisoy Iskro, a good friend of ours, comes back every so often on the show to check in. History she, expert. Yeah. Encyclopedia. You have to be to, to give these history tours that oh, she does. She's amazing. She runs the Detroit History Club and Detroit History Tours, and I've actually been to events for both of those organizations. Me too. Me too. And they're, they're a ton of fun. So we're going to talk to her about the ferry, the Babalo Island Ferry that just... Uh, Babalo earned. Boat. Yeah. And also about the Grand Prix that's over on Belle Isle. At least it was this year. We'll see what happens going forward. I mean, Up in the air. Albuquerque doesn't have the kind of history that we have here. That's for sure. Yeah. Uh, Jag, you had a chance to stop by the Holocaust Memorial Center. Yeah. Speaking of history, um, it is, if you've never been, it is an extremely powerful experience to go. And they've got a really important special exhibit coming later this month that I uh, went over there and learned a lot about and about a lot about the, uh, the history there and what they do over there, too. So we'll hear pieces of your conversation with them. Also, every Thursday, that's when we do our in-depth interview with somebody who is making things happen here in the city of Detroit. Uh, this week, a guy that I've actually interviewed before, but you haven't. Uh, you two haven't met him, right? He's actually I have a, not. He's, he is a fellow uh, Quizzo trivia host along with me, but I've not met him in person. I can't wait to talk to him. Uh, he's, a, he's a great guy. Uh, Mike Jeter and I interviewed him when we did the Detroit vs. Detroiters podcast. His book, uh, How to Live in Detroit Without Being a Jackass, is one that I read when I first moved to town uh, three years ago. Mm-hmm. And I, I took a lot of it to heart, but, you know... You probably I, understand <laughs> a lot more of it now, all the references. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, totally. Yeah, I three totally years do. in. Yeah. yeah, and he's done a number of other things. He is now the city of Detroit's chief storyteller. I do believe we are the only city in America with a chief storyteller. I wonder. We'll, so, we'll ask him that. So yeah. we'll find out what all that means. He's also worked on uh, other books, uh, one that deals with the different neighborhoods, all throughout Detroit. Uh, Long time writer of many publications. Yeah, he was the editor over a black magazine for a while. Mm -hmm. He's done a lot of stuff. So, uh, you know, his his TED Talk is great uh, about Detroit. So uh, excited to talk to Aaron Foley on Thursday. You're definitely going to want to hear that conversation. Want to remind you that if you own an Amazon Echo, and today is Amazon Prime Day, though, it was totally boss. I think it was a (laughs) boss. Hopefully the Echo has a better week than uh, Amazon Prime Day, which kind of went the way of Build-A-Bear Day. Oh, it was terrible. Like, I got caught in this loop and I was ready I was like I'm ready to spend let's go <laughs> you know and just got caught in this loop I think I wound up getting you know like a, a bookmarks yeah something like that. <laughs> guess what in two days you're getting 30 Instapots I know right <laughs> yes <laughs> they're all start showing up on that porch years but if you did buy an Echo for Amazon Prime Day you can listen to this podcast in small bite sized chunks every single morning all you have to do is say Alexa enable the debrief podcast and then we're right there on your Alexa And every morning you say, Alexa, play the Debrief podcast, and she will. And we won't even charge your delivery. We will not. Or or a membership fee. If you're a Prime member, no, definitely not. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Okay, everything having to do with Detroit concerts, comedy, plays, food, drink, and more, it's all coming up. (laughs) Welcome to the D. (laughs) Free D. D. Free Funny stuff. All right, Jag, let's talk about the comedy that's coming to town. So you previewed this last week, Seth. Metro Late Night. This is going to be the uh, local variety show starting as a comedy show but turning into a variety show. They're having their first taping Wednesday night at Mark Ridley's Comedy Castle. I can't wait to go. This is 20 comics going to be on stage all doing their best, tightest, like five, six-minute set. Uh, And I know a lot of these guys. A lot of these guys are very, very funny. It's a smorgasbord of... Smorgish, 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 smorgish. Absolutely. I may a wind buffet. Up, yeah. Let's say a buffet. Okay, there you go. I may wind up being at uh, Mark Ridley's Comedy Castle two times within a week, which uh, I haven't oh, really done in, in quite a while. But uh, As a spectator. As a spectator. Okay, not you know as a mean? performer. Well, because I went and I saw, you know, we've talked about Jeff Horst a lot uh, mm-hmm. lately. And oh, I mean, you, you have the biggest man crush I, on I, Jeff. You know what? I, I <laughs> am saying this. You know, you know what this is like when you know from your radio days when you're watching a band grow, and, and yeah. you watch them, yeah, and you're like, that band is about to take off, and I was there when they were. Oh, I you know. feel that too, and I love that about Detroit because you can see a lot of bands, small venues. Like I saw Foster the People for yep. fifteen bucks right next to them at you know Masonic Temple Very up cool. in the teeny part, you know, and then I was like, Whoa! Your, then they hit it, right? You you know? Wearing right. your pumped up kicks. Uh, <laughs> 
<laughs> of course. See, but the of radio. Course. You can't completely kill the radio <laughs> DJ in me. But that's how I feel of watching Jeff Horst, is that this is a guy, and, I, and I've seen them, you know, and this special, you know, so the way it works at a place like the Comedy Castle uh, is that, you know, like I've said before, Mark Ridley books his entire year out in advance. He takes a lot of the local comics who he thinks are finally ready to do a headlining set yeah. mm-hmm. and puts them on in the summer because it's slower there and, and when they're the first. And so a guy like Jeff, the first place he is going to headline is going to be his home club, Mark Ridley's Comedy Castle. In the summer. Yeah, yeah. before mm-hmm. they book him for a headlining set in Miami or, you know, LA or whatever. Uh, because he's got fans and he can bring friends and family and all that thing here. I saw him do his first headlining set at Comedy Castle last year. Last year was the first year that he got up to do the full, you know, mm-hmm. hour headlining set or whatever and watched him go back and do it this year. Uh, and my girlfriend, had, you know, who had also been there with me last year, you know, we were talking about uh, A, how much new material he was doing. Yeah. You know, there was a lot that I hadn't seen, but there were also things that I had seen him work on in open mics and it was fat. Home the craft. Well, yeah, it's fat because that's what I like about watching a guy like Jeff is you can watch him work and you can watch what he does with bits over time. He is uh, a white comedian who can play in front of white room uh, or in front, in front of a black room or a mixed audience. He talks a lot about race in his act. Okay. Uh, and and it was fascinating to watch him do. We'll have him on in a couple of weeks because on August 24th, he's got his big special coming out. On well, Comedy speaking Central. of your man crush, Jeff Horst, yes. uh, he's also going to be playing Thursday night at Comedy Showcase at Otis Supply in Ferndale, which is a very cool venue. Have you guys been there for any events? I was there, yes. I was mm-hmm. there for like a Jack Daniels uh, like uh, pitch distilled, they called it, where different uh, companies pitch their ideas. Uh, last year. So Jeff Horst doing a comedy showcase there with Josh Adams, Justin O'Leary, and more on Thursday. And Josh Adams is another one of those guys who, like, I don't even know why Josh Adams is still in Michigan. Like, he is so funny. You're like, dude, move, move go to up. L.A. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. Do so like, you have a bigger man crush on him or Jeff? I, I, you know, it sounds like a toss-up. Well, both of those guys are in the, the Motown Laugh Kings here, which is kind of like, you know, their own self-branded little mm-hmm. whatever thing. But Josh Adams is another guy. And the thing about Josh Adams is you watch him on stage, and I can't tell how much of it is him just riffing off the top of his head and how much of it is his set. Well, that's a mark of somebody yeah, who's really good. Okay, another one. Just mm-hmm. amazing. Mm-hmm. Uh, big name on Friday. Now that Caesars Windsor is finally back open and doing shows again, yeah. Trevor Noah from The Daily Show. He is going to be there on Friday night. That will be a good show. I think yes. he's insanely talented. With it. And I wonder if there's anything that's happened this week that he'll have to talk about on Friday. Oh, boy. <laughs> uh, and Saturday, Dave, Land- Dave Landau and Jeff Horst again at the Emerald Theater in Mount Clemens. This is the set's greatest week ever. Jeff oh is doing gosh. like three shows. And well, not only that, Dave Landau. Right. I mean, can't beat that. And so, Jeff Horst, his girlfriend, Esther Navarez, I got to see her on really? Friday night. She opened for Michael Che oh. at Relic Music Theater. I didn't know that going in. No, nope, um, she didn't know that. She found out like within, I think, the last 20 Four hours you know, or that's I what I found out later. Oh, wow. yeah. No yeah. pressure. Yeah, exactly. So, and she killed it. She was great. Yeah, she was great. She is uh, a friend of the show. She actually, Esther is actually our first guest, quote unquote, because when Mike and I started this podcast, we recorded some practice episodes that mm-hmm. never saw the light of day, and we wanted a comedian to come in and be our first interview for us to practice. It's and like a mock interview when you're... Oh, yes. yeah. And it was Esther. And it was, Esther oh. was the one who came in and did it. She's, she seems so kind and yeah. like she would have been great. Yeah. She's very involved in Planet Ant. She also was, uh, emceed their big podcast launch okay, party very over cool. the weekend. Okay. Yeah. How was Michael Che, by the way, Becky? He was awesome. We loved it. And um, he had this funny DJ opening up and it was like, you know, he was... It was all racial out there. You know, the Puerto Ricans, the whites, the blacks, anybody, no one was immune. And everyone was laughing. You know, it just really broke the ice and it just set the tone. And Michael Che, it was cool because the show was over and he just kept going. And I guess this is one of his things. Like if the room is fun and open to it, he just keeps going. So the official show was done. We're like, wow, it's it's getting late and he's still going. And he just kind of plays with things. And, to, you know, so he was kind of saying things about certain people in the audience that were funny. I, I want to like and, him, but he made a joke that offended me once. And I don't what, know if I get past what it. What was the joke? Oh, what? It was the night before the Patriots played the Falcons in the Super Bowl uh, oh, and, he, and he said he said who am I going to root for the blackest city in America or the most racist city in America I'm rooting for the Falcons <laughs> And that offended. Oh uh, well, he he I know started Boston's out. History, but. He started out by talking about R. Kelly. Yeah. And, oh uh, no! And then people were kind of like groaning. You know, he goes, "Oh, people, this it's going to get a lot worse." <laughs> <laughs> and you know, there was Jesus jokes. There were, uh, you know, it was sex and money and everything in between. And uh, but the thing that stopped him was.
was the sound of the train coming yeah. by. And, yeah, and he freaked out. <laughs> he freaked out. He was like, what the hell is that? <laughs> you know? And uh, he's like, I think that's that's my cue, you know? I like when those SNL guys come from stand-up comedy, because most of them come from improv or sketch backgrounds. But mm-hmm. he's, he's one of the comedians. Well, it's funny thing he said, too, about Colin Jost. He was like, okay, we have the same job. He went to Harvard. I didn't go to college. <laughs> His parents are pretty pissed. <laughs> Well, so Colin's like the head joke writer at SNL, though. Is, is well, Che, all, che is, is a head writer. He's is the head writer, too. Yeah, okay. he's, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Head writers always put themselves on Weekend Update. Well, yeah. So, it was uh, great. Other comedy shows this weekend. Speaking of Mark Ridley's Comedy Castle, David Dyer is there. Uh, P- Punchline Comedy Lounge in Southfield has Tori Hart. Holly Hotel has Brett Klein, who combines stand-up with rock and Jewish rap. I'm, I'm not sure if that's like Beastie Boys or exactly yeah, what that is. intriguing. But, um, and he's also an MSU grad, so shout out to the Spartans. Uh, and finally, Big Tommy's at Novi has Jason Hagel, who is a Fortune 500 executive by day and comedian by night. Coming up in just a moment, uh, there is a special exhibit that is coming to the Holocaust Memorial Center in Farmington Hills, and we will tell you all about it. What is Planet Ant? Uh, I'm the editor for Eater Detroit. The restaurant critic for the Detroit Free Press. Caretaker of Say Nice Things About Detroit. The Detroit Symphony Orchestra. Detroit Art Week. WDET 1019. The Detroit Public Theater. Meridian Winter Blast. Detroit Grand Prix. Detroit History Tours. Free Film Festival. Valentine Distilling Company in Ferndale. Mark Ridley's Comedy Castle in Royal Oak. The Hamtramck Music Fest. The Fort Piquet Avenue Plant. Motor City Pride, and you're listening. And you're listening to... And you're looking... Listen, blah, blah, blah. To the debrief or the de- debrief? To the debrief. I said the name wrong. Okay. Let me try that one more time. The debrief. The debrief. I listen to the debrief podcast. The debrief. Just religiously. And you're listening to the debrief. The debrief. The debrief. I'm so sorry. <laughs> All right, Becky, what's going on around town? All right, stick with me, guys, because there is so much going on. A um, couple of things that we told you about, but I just want to mention again, because they're this weekend. At the Russell Industrial Center, the Michigan Glass Project, uh, we had interviewed organizer Drew Cups. So that's the whole... Seth's favorite thing, the glass blowing. I love glass blowing. <laughs> I'm told the secret is to not inhale. Well, that would work, yeah. <laughs> Ask Bill uh, Clinton about that. Uh. So go to that. That's uh, the 20th through the 22nd. And don't forget, it benefits art programs in Detroit Public Schools. Also, Detroit Art Week, who we just had the spotlight interview with uh, Amani and Alea last week. They were um, great. Yeah. Uh, that's the showcase of contemporary art and culture. It's a self-guided tour. Over 100 artists. Go. It's free. Go to Gallery Studios. And this is the first one. We want Inaugural. there to be more of these. Yes. So please go and show support. Yes. And as always, there'll be links to all of this on our website. Uh, Thursday evening. July 19th at the Michigan Science Center. We've talked about this before. They have these adult-only after-dark events once in a while. So this one's going to be a vintage video game night. Uh, Mario Kart, Duck Hunt, my favorite, Just Dance. Nice. Um, and you get uh, you can get drinks at two cash bars. There's a full concession menu. I need that to play Just Go Dance. To- I need a couple drinks before I'm going to dance. Oh, then I you're ap- your best dance. Like, tequila always makes you a good dancer. I apologize. I'm, a little, I'm dragging a little bit tonight. I was up till 3 a.m. because I fell into the Super Nintendo rabbit hole last night. So there's something about those retro video games okay so my 15 and 17 year olds they're still going to be doing that at your age yes at oh. 37 they will be oh. they, they'll be better video games but they won't be oh. they won't be living in your house that's so you true so what do i what well, do i care i have I care? been to these michigan science center adult nights that they do uh and there's a great photo of me and like a you know four ghostbusters just hanging out like blowing slime all over a big painting that comes from this i mean these, these things are fun yeah, to be able to yeah. go in and do that without all the little kids around. running around yes uh, so Friday, July 20th at the Charles H. Wright Museum, the Secret Society of Twisted Storytellers, um, hosted by Satori Shakur. Uh, the theme this time is Big Sexy. Um, <laughs> so who knows what could happen? This is the whole, it's a little different than The Moth. So this is a curated storytelling event where the storytellers are selected. It's not out of the audience. So, it's packed every time. Oh, it's so popular. Um, so get tickets. If there's a few left, get them now. Um, includes musical and dance uh, numbers as well. Uh, Michigan Humane Society is bringing the Meet Your Best Friend Pet Adoption event. It's normally at the zoo, but they're bringing it to Eastern Market on Sunday, July 22nd. Uh, 50 adoptable cats, kittens, dogs, and puppies. And, Jay, didn't you get your dog? My, my wife and I, well, my wife, it's, my wife would tell you it's her dog because oh. she adopted him, and I just happened to be there. We were just friends at the time, and she adopted oh. him and took him home. But we went to the zoo, and she took, like, three different dogs out of the cage and, like, took them for a walk, a little test drive. And mm-hmm. the one that just sat there and gave her the puppy dog eyes and hooked her in and... Uh, kind of like you. 
Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and um, and we and uh, she looked at him and said, "Do you want to come home with me?" And he hopped in the back of her Jeep, and Aww. Brady came home with her six. Yeah, six years ago. Oh, and I know you love that pooch. He's I, 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 sweet. I've yeah. never known the joy of and pure love until moving in with her and having a dog in the house. It's, ah, cool. The Michigan Humane Society does a great, great job. So if you can make it to this event, if you're thinking about adopting, please It's go. a good one to do. Yeah. Adopt, don't shop. Exactly. Uh, Open Streets Detroit is coming up on Saturday, uh, the 21st, uh, in Rouge Park. So there's been other of these Open Streets events, um, different roads each time. This time it's three miles a road in Detroit's Rouge Park. So it's it, it turns it into a car-free zone. So it's like a family block party, basically. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, yeah, you can bike, run, skateboard, scooter, whatever you got, hang out. Um, it's all to promote physical activity in the city and, you know, just family and community togetherness. Um, speaking of family fun, Milford is now home to the longest zip line in the state. I would do that. Have, have you guys ziplined? Yeah, I did in Jamaica one time. I loved it. I yeah. did this down uh, in Kentucky, uh, and and you can do this underground, uh, just outside of Louisville. Oh, like in the Mammoth Caves? Or, uh, or? Yeah, I mean these okay. these are man made caves that oh, you can do them in. Okay. But but yeah, you and it was six zip lines through mm. you know, and there's st- stalactites and stalagmites Whoa. there, and they throw like you know they, they basically set up glowing lights, and that's all you can see. see. Oh, that's <laughs> so fun. Save the, the darkness dark. element yeah, too. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Well, so this one, it opened last weekend at uh, Camp Dearborn, which, yes, is in Milford, in case you didn't know. See, I but saw that story and thought it was in Dearborn, so no, thank you for clarifying. Camp, yeah. Camp Dearborn is in Milford. Where's Camp um, Milford? Um, Dearborn. Oh. No, they don't, they're not lucky <laughs> enough to have one. So it's 1,400 foot long, and it goes over a lake. It starts at a six six story tower and goes across the lake. I feel like so. that makes me more nervous being over water than Or this. more exciting, depending on your outlook. are you actually on the zip line for? That's got to be a while. You, you know, I feet, thought yeah. the same thing. I'm not sure. And I think it probably de- depends on your body weight and everything, how long it would, you know, Physics. how fast you would go. Yeah, It's five football fields almost. So, pretty cool. Uh, Wayne State University, uh, they're permanently closing the Bonstell Theater. So, it's a little bit of controversy around this, but they're going to expand the Hillberry Theater and that will become a whole new complex, including performance labs, design studio on the main stage with the idea of all the performing arts programs at the university will be under the Hillberry complex and together. And it's going to be renamed the Gretchen. Um, I'm not sure how to pronounce um, the lady jazz center. Um, so some of the students are like, well, that'd be great. We'll all be together. Others are like, well, no, the bond is just a beautiful historic building. So we'll see how it all turns out. There's no word yet on what the bond is going to become. Some uh, rumors of a hotel perhaps. The Slipstream Theater Initiative in Ferndale has a new show opening July 20th. It's called Lost in Three Pines. Uh, Detroit Actors Theater Company has In the Heights um, just running July 18th through the 22nd. And Tipping Point Theater in Northville has a new show opening July 19th called The Impossibility of Now. This is the Deep Breeze. All right, Jag, talk to us about what's going on at the Holocaust Memorial Center. So um, I had been there previously for just a a high holidays Jewish service. Um, I'd never really spent a lot of time in the museum. And uh, Becky, you've been there, right? I have a few times. It's really an experience. So moving and impactful. Seth, you have not been, I assume? I I have not. This is Farmington Hills? Yep, it's on Orchard Mm -hmm. Lake Road, just north of 12 Mile. It's a beautiful facility, too, and just done... Oh my gosh! I don't even know how to describe it's it. It's powerful. just very powerful. And, yeah. and, and again, and full disclosure here, I am Jewish. I don't know of any relatives I had that were in the Holocaust. So, oh. but this, you know, Jewish or not, will affect you. But it especially hits home for me, being for sure. of the Jewish faith. So, well, and even now, though, I mean, given the current climate and everything that's going on in this country, I mean, it is. Mm-hmm. This is something that. You know, I mean, I grew up thinking that, oh, this kind of stuff is way in the past. Yeah. And it very much doesn't feel like it these no. days. And we'll There's get into a this a little bit of... later in the interview about how it's relevant today and, and survivor stories and that. But I went down there because they've got a special exhibit coming. So I talked to Robin Axelrod, who is the senior educator, and Sarah Saltzman, who is the director of events for the Holocaust Memorial Center Zeckelman Family Campus uh, in Farmington Hills. So um, the v- exhibit is basically... Um, it's filmmakers who were brought over to the concentration camps as they were liberated to document what the Allied forces found when they got to the concentration camps and, and what they found. So the, uh, Robin described the exhibit a little bit. 
The special exhibit, Filming the Camps from Hollywood to Nuremberg, is actually an exhibit that was put together by the Memorial de la Shoah in Paris, and it's traveled to museums around the world. We felt that it was very important to show evidence of the atrocities of the Holocaust that really documented with truth and honesty, and it takes visual footage from major Hollywood directors and shows the liberation of the concentration camps during World War II. The directors that are featured, John Ford, George Stevens, and Samuel Fuller, are legends in Hollywood, but really their experiences during World War II are documented in this exhibit, and it shows how their experiences change them as people, not just as filmmakers. Did they know what they were going to be filming when they first went up? Or, I mean, did they really have an idea? Because I always think, um, I don't know if you ever saw the, the HBO miniseries Band of Brothers. Yes, which, I did. And I always remember that one episode where they finally got to the concentration camps and liberated people. And you got the sense that they didn't oh, know what they were going into. What was actually going on there. Yeah. Or, or at least not to the full extent. See, I don't think they did. And that leads into our, our next clip from Robin because it was General Eisenhower, who, of course, later became president. Uh, he was in charge of the Allied forces in Europe. And when he got there and saw what was going on, and this, and Robin will explain this, that he knew they had to document this because nobody would have believed what was happening. <sighs> That's so important. What this exhibit demonstrates for us is how photographs and film footage documents history. They're raw images, they're horrific images, but they were shot intentionally so that we could see what happened. General Eisenhower, very early on, wrote a letter to General Marshall and said, no one is going to believe this if we do not document this. It is so horrible. What I am finding entering these camps is so inhumane and so awful, I must record it for posterity. And he told George Stevens, we must gather evidence of war crimes that can be used in a military tribunal. And so he knew that whatever was recorded had to be used later to document war crimes. I mean, that's some amazing foresight when I was you think say, about leadership yeah. that is a mark of a leader because it's yeah. it's actually been a problem that there are people who deny that this happened oh, and yeah. there were holocaust don't deniers then there Still were holocaust deniers day. now yeah, yeah. well and, and even now as we get back into the age of fake news and there's whiplash right. and, and things that just are not true or said right in the public and and people mm. believe them yeah you know i mean something like this is so amazingly important to have Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And like you said, it was Eisenhower's foresight to think not only, okay, we need to show this so people don't think we made it up. And they actually made sure that there were American and allied soldiers in these videos to yeah, as proof to, that to this was this was a, a sound place. stage in Hollywood. Yeah. Um, and then also knowing that they would need that video evidence when they eventually tried the Nazis at the Nuremberg trials. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, Eisenhower deserves all the credit in the world for thinking that far ahead. Um, so I asked uh, Robin and Sarah about the exhibit. It's actually traveled. It's been to several other uh, Holocaust museums around the world. And the setup is actually pretty interesting. They were setting it up as I got there to speak to them uh, early last week. And uh, Robin explained a little bit about how it works. The exhibit is made up of a series of kiosks, which shows a lot of screens showing the raw footage taken by these three directors during the actual experience in World War II, as well as some of the footage afterwards when they were in Hollywood, one of the most interesting things, Samuel Fuller went on to do a movie called The Big Red One. It refers to how the war changed him, and you see a lot of discussion and text about the directors and how the war changed them as people. George Stevens, after the war, did... Uh, movie, The Diary of Anne Frank. So you really learn a lot about their experiences as soldiers, how it touched them. And there's also a lot of footage from the crime trials in Nuremberg itself. You know, part of the thing that occurs to me as we go through, and, and, and Americans are very divided at the moment and the way that mm -hmm. they talk to each other has been that for a lot of us, not all of us, but for a lot of us, it has been a long time since we've actually 
lived through or seen a war. And, right. And, and many of us, is, it's never happened. I mean, when you look at the the small percentage of people that went over to Iraq or Afghanistan, sure. uh, it didn't touch the number of American lives that say Vietnam or certainly World War II or the right. Civil War did. Sure. And that, that may be why we're a little divided Removed. a little quick yeah, to yeah. Uh, uh, be belligerent and quick right. to... There wasn't that unifying kind of shared experience. And so. the horrifying yeah. and the, the, oh my God, we can never That's what let I mean. this yeah, happen like that again. Unify, like, we gotta be in this together and not, yeah. Well, you know, and it's what's interesting about that point is there are some survivors left and what, uh, what I think is really incredible that the Holocaust Center in Farmington Hills does is they have uh, several Holocaust survivors that come in and speak almost on the daily and obviously they're getting much older now so there's a, there's a limited window for how long they're going to be live and she was telling me also that, you know, sometimes if it's the winter time, you know, someone might not be able to make it because right. of the weather, might not have somebody to shovel out their car, that kind of stuff. Um, but the power of an actual Holocaust survivor, somebody who was actually physically there is unbelievable. Yeah, I've heard two of them speak. Really? At, yes. And the one man was 94 mm -hmm. and I just, you just want to hold them in your heart. I mean, it's just yeah. like a story. Um, you just can't, you don't want to believe it because it's so horrible. And for someone that survived and they lived to be 94, the strength of character and the things they had to go through. And you just, you want to put them in this capsule. Like don't, you know, you know, they're eventually going to pass away. And, and that kind of one, uh, you know, First person account is is like nothing else, and they're and they're making a lot of recordings. Yeah, but, thank but, goodness. But to have that in person, um, and Sarah actually talked about having the survivors there in the museum. The people who actually survived the Holocaust have uh, a unique place in history to be able to tell the world what happened to them, what their lives were like before the Holocaust, during and how they've built their lives, how they've been resilient and built their lives since surviving. The average age of Holocaust survivors today is around 88 years old. We know that in the not too distant future, we will be living in a world without eyewitnesses, without people who lived the events. The fact that they survived is remarkable, and there is absolutely no substitute for sitting face to face with a survivor of genocide, hearing their account, being able to ask them questions, and invariably after a survivor speaks to a group, especially with students, students go forward toward the survivor. They want to touch that person. They want to know that that person is real. That's the experience I had. I went with some student groups and they just flock. And what struck me too is these people live through literal hell. Yes. And now they go and talk about it every week. Yeah. Can you imagine? They're like reliving it, reliving it, reliving it. I know that's not how they look at it, but that's a part of me that thought about, gosh, you know? You know, and, and I can hear your, your voice cracking a little bit, yeah. and I'm right there with you. And one of the things that, uh, that Robin and Sarah told me about is for some of these folks, as they get into their 80s and their 90s, some of them some of them don't have the same strength to do it anymore. Yeah, and some I of can them, imagine. I mean, if, I mean, how emotionally burning out it is to relive it. And, and it's so mm -hmm. important to, to tell, and as you said, have students there and, and mm -hmm. having them talk about it in person and how important that is but some of these folks god bless them they get to a point where it's just it, it just becomes too much of a burden yeah, for them and you so don't blame them you couldn't blame them one no. bit and you thank them for recording whatever they have and the time they have spent with people it, mm -hmm. it's it's incredible um, you know, and a point that you made earlier, Seth, is, you know, I wanted to ask them about this, and this is not partisan, this is not Republican, Democrat, liberal, conservative, you know, pro-Trump, anti-Trump, any of that stuff, but given the current political climate, you know, I asked Robin and Sarah about what lessons we can learn in 2018 from what happened 75 years ago, and here's what Sarah had to say. The Holocaust was the deliberate, systematic, bureaucratic attempt to wipe off the face of the world an entire group of people, the Jews. The fact that the Holocaust was limited to Europe is really only because the war ended. If Hitler and the Nazis had their way, they would have wiped out Jews from the entire face of the world. So it's evidence of man's inhumanity to man 
and the dangers of what happens when we ignore unbridled hatred. And we all see hatred every day. And it's our responsibility as human beings to take a stand, to think critically about what's going on around us, and then to do something about it. The imagery that this exhibit provides lets us see the events as they unfolded. People think that the Holocaust was an event that happened long ago and far away. And while that's true, it could happen anywhere at any time. And we think it's vitally important to teach the lessons of the Holocaust, not just to the Jewish community. This is a human story. So it's important to teach it to everyone. I think what she says there that's so important is that you can't just ignore it. No. You know, it's not right. enough to sit there and go, oh, there's something bad happening. I'm not going to participate and I'm going to think badly about the people who are engaging in this yeah. type of behavior. That that ignoring it is – and look, I think there's probably a lot of people that were around at the time who did not realize the full extent of what sure, was going sure. on. I mean, this the, the, the concentration camps, the Nazi stuff had started in the late 30s. Right. And obviously America didn't get involved until Pearl Harbor was bombed in December of 41 until we were attacked. Right. Because it was, it was a world away – was it was off people's radar there wasn't the internet to see what was going no, on no you didn't have the information and even with the internet and the media i mean there's a lot going on in camps in america that right now know. that we don't know no. about and that they're no. not letting us in and they're they're only putting government photos on. and i don't yep. know that it's this stuff that's going on but i don't know that it's not either well if you want to make a parallel something that really struck me when i was there in the museum was one of the exhibits and obviously you should go uh, and and see this the this movie footage but becky you said you've seen there's there's other footage that you walk through a very tight constricting hallway oh, to yeah, see with the black and white films yeah but also there was an exhibit of a refugee ship that left europe and bound for the us of jewish refugees that were escaping the nazis and they got to the point where they could actually see land in florida and they were turned back. And the ship went back across the Atlantic, want back, back to London. And those many of the Jews on that ship were eventually killed in concentration and death camps. So there's a, some parallels to what's going on today. Right, right. Because we here said we don't care about how bad your situation is. Not our problem. No, not, our, not problem. our problem. Yeah. Not yeah. on our soil. Um, there is so, so many amazing things there that I could t- sit here and talk to you all night about. Two things that really stuck with me uh, seeing the museum, in addition to this fantastic exhibit that opens on July 26th, is the first thing you walk in, and I think I put this on our Instagram when I was there last week, the first thing you see when you walk into the museum, if you've never been, is a cattle car. And when you walk in, you know what that cattle car was. That was they packed that full of Jews and sent them to mm-hmm. concentration camps. And the second you see it, it, it really, oh, yeah. it, it's like a gut punch and it takes your it breath really away. Is. And then conversely, about the duration of the human spirit in life, there was a tree that Anne Frank had planted. And you're smiling and nodding. Yeah. Um, and there was some, there was a plant disease or something, and something was going to happen to that tree. But they were able to save a sapling from that tree and plant it. And the tree has now grown there at the Holocaust Center, right here in Farmington Hills. You can see a tree that grew out of the tree that Anne Frank, Frank Anne Frank planted. And there's just something so powerful and symbolic about that. that Definitely, it's really something sign else. of hope and yeah, renewal. It, I, I really feel like this. And again, I, I disclosure, I am Jewish, but whether I'm, but regardless of that, oh, and, yeah, and, no, I, yeah. it, this is a place that you need to go check out. Um, and also, uh, this exhibit, it's going to open July 26th. The opening event on the 26th is uh, free. You just have to RSVP ahead of time. Uh, and, and if you want to see the exhibit, it's going to be there until December 30th. If you want more, their website is holocaustcenter.org. This is the D Brief about last week. Every now and then, we got to take a moment and we got to stop and smell the roses and reflect upon what happened over the last seven days. So, Becky, we'll start with you. What did you do? Oh, well, I went to the Concert of Colors. Yes, we've been talking about this for yeah, weeks. Yeah. So, How was it? Oh, my gosh. It exceeded expectations, and my expectations were pretty high. Had so, you been before? Is this the first I, time? I have been, but it's been a while, and I hadn't been to like one of the big signature shows. So I think this was the 11th year for the Don Was Detroit All-Star Review, mm-hmm. and I have actually not seen that before. So, um, And the theme this year was Detroit Rock. Detroit Rock. So, so what did that mean? How did that so play So it meant out? that there were... Um, Sets. Uh, so each uh, performer uh, that was highlighted picked two songs that had something to do with Detroit Rocks. So the All Star Band was there the whole time. Uh, for instance, you know, Luis Resto was on keys and piano. Don was was on bass. Um, 
so they stayed, but then a singer would come and and do two songs that weren't their own. They were another Detroiters rock songs. Ah. So it was super cool format, and Ann Delisi emceed the whole thing. So she'd come out, introduce the person, and then she would wrap up with them and say, "Why did you choose the songs?" You know, and it oh, cool. spanned uh, a very long time period. Um, lots of highlights. The the energy just just exploded in there it was really great um wayne kramer was there so i think he was the only one that actually did his own show his own songs of mc5 mc5 he did his own songs what did he do Um, he didn't did he do kick out the jams ramblin rose no although the guy from the dirt bombs came and did kick out the jams to close the show ah so that was a cool mashup um, what other songs were covered or, you know, do you remember? I mean, there were, uh, there was a White Stripes song. There were, um, uh, Alice Cooper's, uh, School's Out for Summer. Nice. Yeah. It was a big range. Uh, Kenny Watson, uh, came and did, um, and I'm not going to remember, um, his great uncle, but he did his great uncle song. That was kind of like the Motown kind of crooner song. Um, they covered Electric Six songs. It was just amazing and kind of a, a lesson for me, too. I probably was really familiar with about half and then like somewhat familiar with the other. And then there were one or two songs that I didn't know at all. Right. So it was really cool. And Anne did a great job of like kind of explaining it. Um, and she had on this like amazing dress that was made out of uh, car fabric from a local designer that I actually want to have when her you on the show. you say car fabric, you mean like, like interior. Like, interior like, yeah. like, like the upholstery of the seats? Kind right, of? That's right. That's awesome. It was all fringe. I put a picture of her um, on, on our Instagram. So check that out. And I tagged the designer. But anyway, that's a side note. Um, and I think that a highlight for me was, like I said, Wayne Kramer came out. This guy is 70 years old, okay? He's from my whole hometown of Lincoln Park. And he's, you know, been in prison, major addict, overcame addiction. He's out here at 70 rocking your socks off. I, I, just unbelievable. Better than a lot of musicians in their 20s that I've seen. He And he's not even the original singer. And he was singing the songs. You know, it was just really inspiring. And to know that this all like came from Detroit, the energy all the performers had together. And then at the end of the show, they were all on stage together. It just was like one big family from all these genres, all ages. It was just super cool. And then... It was really nice to go backstage and meet everybody. And she's we, enjoying we, this. The celebrity yeah. tour about comes, this, right? Uh, because this is like old hat for Seth and me. Where to we me, to I, I hope show. I never lose the stars <laughs> in my eyes because it was great, and it was great to bring Ben, who's fifteen and a musician himself. This is your son, our, yeah, our son, and. Um, so me and my husband got to bring him back there for him to to directly meet a lot of the musicians and they were so kind and like what do you play you got to keep playing buddy you know encouraging that's him that's so cool yeah. and and he's it kind of like sparked yeah I really got to commit to this and stuff so that in my experience is when musicians are the nicest is when they've been around for a long time and they have nothing left to prove yeah we've talked about this yeah Every, when bands are on their way up that's and different. they've got their first big hit and they're mm-hmm. just getting their taste of it that's when they're kind of you know, that's like, generally speaking, you know, not that I know many of these people, but somebody with a million dollars might be a little bit snarky and somebody with $10 million will be super nice. Right. It's like, right. It, yeah. And just the Detroit community, like one of my other highlights was Jessica Hernandez of Jessica Hernandez and the Deltas. Um, she's from Southwest Detroit. She came, she covered Rodriguez, Sugar Man, and Louis Resto um, played some really cool synth music on that and mm-hmm. she just did this like real smoky version and just to see okay here's a guy who's won Oscar Grammy here's a, a younger artist who's making it and then they're covering Rodriguez who's this legendary Detroit artist that we didn't even know about till the movie came out and because he was big in South Africa you know just the story you can't you can't make this stuff up and to see it all coming together on stage and it was free all right, Jag, top that. What'd you do? <laughs> <laughs> I know, that's a big one. I can't so. top that in terms of We music. should not let her go first anymore. Uh, top, yeah. <laughs> I don't always have stuff this good, and it's not me. It's t- Tough it's act to follow. Yeah. So what you're saying is it was a great show. It was a rocking show. Uh, so on Saturday at night, I went to Pig and Whiskey in Ferndale, which is one of my absolute favorite festivals I'm in the area. I'm jealous. I wanted to go to this. I've never been to this. And and you know, and you know, Becky and I have talked about our shared experience spending time in New Orleans, and there's a festival. Uh, yeah. This is is like a New Orleans level festival I would and agree. then some. Yeah, this is like I would agree. several blocks in Ferndale right by Nine Mile and Woodward and you know you walk around there's all these different types of whiskey tastings and beer of course too and you know for me I'm like 
how do I decide? I actually went twice. I was on my way somewhere and I grabbed, I parked illegally and I grabbed a quick $6 pulled pork sandwich and, uh-huh. and left. And then I went back later in the evening and then I walked around. I'm like, oh, I'm going to really make a good decision. And I'm like, oh, Slows is here. I, 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 how do you turn down Slows? So I got from Slows, this is also on the debrief Instagram, I got the stranger, which is bourbon cured bacon, bacon aioli, coleslaw, and jalapenos on a roll, which I thought would be a little bit too hot. Yeah. Yeah. Perfectly balanced. It was delicious. Huh. I had it with a uh, with a Sam Adams cherry weed actually, and um, and a uh, apple cider whiskey shot. And oh, it was just I I wish I could go to this thing once a month. It's amazing. <laughs> nice. Well, you can go to Slows like yes. as much as you want. Right. So I I've been on a beer cook lately, mm-hmm. uh, and and I have had periods. Yeah, in I my need life. to talk to you about that. I know. Is everything I know. okay? I, know. <laughs> I've, I, I have definitely had periods in my life where I'm like, all right, we're gonna lose weight, no beer for a while. It's just gonna be you know the clear yeah. spirits, and I'm definitely not in that phase at the moment. No. Um, okay. We, this is a hard state, you know, Michigan to. Go off beer in. It really because is. Because the beer is good here. You know, I mean, the I, beer is outstanding here. Well, did you hear too? Uh, the, the beer sales are down overall, like nationwide. But in Michigan now, 10% of our sales are Michigan craft beer. Yeah, yeah it was 2%. It was 2%. Now it's now it's 10%. Yeah. You've got some, it's so good. Look, I don't like IPA, but the Two Hearted is amazing. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and so I, I've been on this thing lately. My favorite thing to do is to go into a brewery and order the sampler and the get flights. You know, yeah, flights, yeah. the little yeah. five ounce or whatever pours. And so I did. I'd never been to Batch Brewing. Uh, over in Corktown. Oh, I like that place. And I went where, down there. Where is that? It's 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 over in Corktown. It's yeah. a it's off a, of Michigan. Yeah, yeah. It's okay. a couple Bye. blocks off. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it's almost by itself. Yeah, it's down the street from Mudgies. Yeah. But, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, but the, it's not like there's a bunch of things. No, right outside no. of it. Uh, and and so we went over there, uh, ordered the flight. Uh, you know, and when I order a flight. I don't have to love every beer that I have. To me, it's fine because I'm experimenting and I expect, and that's built into Two my or three out of four is okay in a flight. Yeah. yeah. I mean, look, if there's lots that are great, and, and these were some weird, strange, fruity, oh, okay. sour. Do you remember what they were? Odd. I mean, oh, no, because no. I went through the whole list. I mean, seriously, oh. I go into a place like that. <laughs> he was that. there a long time. Brother, you need to get the, do you have the untapped app? No, no, no. There was, oh, yeah. Uh, the, That's the, a good there one. Were, no, I don't. I, I, you're you should right, get I it. should. Um, no, because we went through three flights, and I did everything that wasn't labeled IPA. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> you're Oops. a man after my heart. You I hope, you, uh, hope someone else is driving. Yeah, uh, I think so. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, I, 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 will say, I will say this, though. The untapped app, my brother was making fun of me the other day. He's like, oh, you just are untapped, so you can post on Facebook what beers you had. No, no, no. no. There are so many amazing craft beers in Michigan. I, I do go on tap so I can see if I've had a beer before or, or not. Explain yeah. how it works for people who aren't familiar with it's the app. A, so you check in, and you can share it on Facebook and Twitter if you want, or just in, within the Untapped app. You check in uh, with whatever beer you're drinking. You can post a picture. You can rate it from one to five, and then you can uh, and you can write a little description on it. Plus, it's social, too. Like you, So you should friend my husband on there. He yeah. loves it. And so, then you can cheers other people or see so what they're I have, drinking. I have had, and I joined this. Says I joined June 11th, 2016. I have sampled 117 unique beers. Same. So if I'm in a store and I want to build your own six pack, and it's a store that's got a bunch of different beers, um, I look and say, "Oh, I like that one," or "Oh, have I tried that one?" No, I haven't tried that. Let me try that one too. Okay, yeah. but that works if you go into a package store. But if you are Seth, going a into a party store, party you store, you got to get your whatever whatever you corner it. store, it's a whatever, party whatever store. you call it. liquor store is what I package call them. Package store. Uh, I, I knew it started. They don't with a sell P. packages. I'm not they, from here. They sell. <laughs> parties. Yes, it's a party in a store. That works if you're buying beers in bottles or cans, but when you're going to... I'll a do little... that in a restaurant, too, like Griffin Claw oh, is right by me, and, and I'll pick the flight no, 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 based no, no, on if no, I've no, had no, them before. But, but if you go into a microbrew where they make these things and they may only do a run for three months, mm-hmm. is it's it going to be in the app? It's still in, it's there. in the app. The really? app is very, very um, extensive. All right. Yeah. I'll Get, have to check. Download the Untapped app. It's free. I do want to say one other thing. This podcast episode of The Debrief is brought to you by Untapped. I know. Yes. I do I do want to say one other thing about the place about Batch is that the food was it's outstanding. So good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, it, good it to was know. Amazing. You it's know. way. Uh, it's elevated from your typical brewery yeah. food. I, th- I think. Uh, I thought yeah. so too. I, th- I thought it was really good. So, uh, shout out to them. Uh, all right, coming up in just a few. The last Warped tour that's going to happen in the Detroit area is coming up. We'll tell you all about it. The D three. The D three. 
Sports Report. Jag, what's happening with the sports? Talking about a lot of big events coming to Detroit. You win some, you lose some. So we officially have the PGA event coming June 20, uh, 2019 to the Detroit Golf Club. And of course, because of who's backing it, it will be the PGA Rocket Mortgage Classic. Hmm. So uh, thank you, Mr. Gilbert, for bringing golf back to Detroit and a lot of tourism dollars. That's a dollars. beautiful club, too. It is. It is. But I mean, of course, it's going to be called the Rocket yeah. Mortgage Classic. <laughs> <laughs> That's the good news. The bad news is uh, Detroit had been a finalist for hosting a Final Four. They put bids in for 2023, 4, 5, and 6, tw- those, that, those four years. They were in the running with Dallas, Houston, Phoenix, L.A., San Antonio. We just found out this afternoon, Monday, uh, they did not get any of the bids for those four years, which is unfortunate because anybody you talked to who came in for the NCAA tournament this year when Loved it was a Little it. Series Arena raved about yes. how, how great Detroit is since the last time they are here for Final Four, eight, nine years ago. So it's a shame we didn't get that, but hopefully in the next round of bidding, uh, we'll get that. Better news. Detroit FC, that's the football club, uh, well, FC football club, this, yeah. or as we would call it, soccer, uh, that they play in Hamtramck. Uh, they are really trying to go from being a semi-pro league to joining one of these organized professional leagues. Not on a major league soccer level, but but kind of the next couple levels down. Mm-hmm. Um, and they're hugely successful. Like, they're drawing 5,000 people per match and then 7,000 when they have, like, an exhibition. They call them those international the friendlies. friendlies when a yeah. team comes over from overseas. Soccer is cooler than it was when I, oh. I was a kid. Yeah, it, you know, it's like, it's not... Um, uncool to be into it. Like with the World Cup now. Oh it's my like, God, my yeah. Facebook feed. People just yeah. won't shut up about the World <laughs> Cup. Well, but it's it's cool. And actually my son Ben, is he's a big soccer player and he's doing a soccer camp right now and some of the coaches are FC players. Oh, so he must be thrilled. Yeah, he was like, oh yeah, it's the first thing he told me when I picked him up. My thing with soccer, and I understand it's the most popular sport in the world, and I'll watch it casually every four years. Like I watched some of the World Cup, like a couple matches. For me, because I'm such a big sports guy and I grew up on the four American sports, baseball, yeah. hockey, football, basketball. For me, especially now that I'm married and I have other priorities, I don't have the bandwidth to add another sport. Like, I'm maxed out. So that's yeah, why I, I can't add soccer. You know what, though? Go to an FC game. It's cheap. It's fun. It's raunchy. It's like... Raunchy? Oh, yeah. It's like the craziest, dirtiest songs and smoke bombs. And it's unique. Really? Yeah. It's a good time. It's like, you don't even have to care about the game. All right. Fair <laughs> enough. Uh, you can, but yeah. Uh, the, the big sports story this week in town, Jim Brandstetter, who was the uh, color commentator for the Lions radio for 30 years. So he uh, gets on the phone with WJR and says, okay, let's renegotiate the next contract. And they said, yeah, we're going to go in a different direction, and we're not going to bring you back. According to according to Jim, they let him know by speakerphone uh, after 30 years. <laughs> Bye. Well, at least it wasn't a text. <laughs> at least they didn't get broken up. I don't think we should see each other anymore. I, I mean, you and I have seen this before. This happens in radio. I mean, and you look, you're not really in radio until you're fired, fired. at yeah. least once. He's been I mean, there a long time. But that's a long time, and I, I'm surprised. That's sad. Just, and I think a lot of people were blindsided by this. Yeah. Fans and colleagues. And, and WJR has only had the games for a couple of years from when they got him away from, I believe it was the ticket. Um, yeah, the, the ticket had them. Um, and then uh, he's being replaced by Lomas Brown, who's done a lot of analysis work for Channel 4. Uh, and they're actually good friends, Jim and oh. Lomas. And so Jim's like, look, you know, as, as you said, Seth, this is how it goes on radio. There's no ill will there towards Lomas because that's just that it's, it wasn't he didn't try to push him out. And yeah. Lomas has a lot of respect for what Jim did. And, and they just a lot of professional respect there. I mean, it's weird, but I've actually been in that situation. So I remember getting a call to uh, run a radio station as a program director. And it was a friend of mine. It was a mentor of mine oh, who dear. had the job. Oh. And I remember asking the question: Is is it a choice? Is it me or him? And and they were like, No, he's oh, he's yeah. out, That's no matter tough. what. Yeah. And so at that point, you're like, All right, I, I gotta, you know. Mm-hmm. I, I guess I got to take it, and, and he and I have remained friends to oh, this day. To this yeah. day, like, because people know many, it's, many it's, years it's not you. Know, it's yeah. not your fault. Right. You didn't say, Hey, I want to get rid of this guy. Yeah. Uh, so so that's that's kind of where that went. And then finally, uh, some good news for the Tigers, which has been rare and hard to come by this right. season. <laughs> so Tigers who've been struggling yesterday, Sunday, they go up against all-world former Tiger Justin Verlander, again, the world champion Houston Astros, and Verlander's going to mow them down, right? No. 
four home runs off Verlander, and they beat the Houston Astros yesterday 6-3. to three. So uh, a, a lone bright moment for wow. those Tigres this year. That's got to feel good. Yeah. You know, um, and, and Justin Verlander tweeted after the game saying, that was like the strangest day of my career. I, I know bet. I'm friends with all those guys, and they lit me up, and good for them. So Tigers have the all-star break at the beginning of the week, and this weekend they are home against my other team, the Boston Red Sox. And if you go Saturday night, you get a Ron Garden higher Garden Gnome. Oh. <laughs> I need one of those. Yeah, who doesn't? He kind of looks like a gnome, so it's perfect. (laughs) Coming up, the Grand Prix. Is it going to stay on Belle Isle? Well, we're going to find out a little bit about the history of the race uh, from Bailey of Detroit History Tours. This is the deep, 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 deep. Concert calendar. Becky, let's talk about the concerts that are coming to town. Sure thing. Wednesday, July 18th, Kesha and Macklemore at DTE and Boney James at Shane Park. Thursday the 19th, the Beach Boys at Freedom Hill. Friday the 20th, Neo and Brandy at Shane Park. And the Vans Warp Tour for its last edition Aww. at Meadowbrook. I'm yeah. sad about this. I can see the tears. This was a, a big deal for me every summer when I was running radio stations, is that we would go out to the Warp Tour, and we would basically set up camp backstage. Stay. I mean, yeah. Yeah. I, I realize backstage is still new for you. But, uh, <laughs> no, well, all day, though, I, I'd be a little, yeah. This, this was, you know, this and OzFest were the two that where you would just go there. And this was more fun, because this was always a little bit more my speed yeah. musically. Yeah, yeah. Uh, because I loved a lot of these bands. This was a lot of when that email and Screamo stuff was breaking. You know, I love mm-hmm. bands like Finch and Something Corporate. Okay. And the Used. The Used is, they'll yeah, be there. All those Some guys 41. coming up very early in their career. And we would literally interview like 10, 15 bands in a day. In a row, wow. And I just loved this tour. So I'm so sad to hear I that know, it's... I know, it's a uh, bummer. Yeah. Pour one out for the Vans Warp Tour. Yeah. So also on Friday the 20th, Ms. Lauren Hill at Freedom Hill. And Ted Nugent at DTE. Talk about opposite ends of the political yep, spectrum there. Exactly. Uh, Saturday, the 21st, Wiz Khalifa at DTE. And this is a cool one. So the band Saint Motel, um, they are putting on a free concert at Beacon Park. And they're a great band. They're super fun. Um, it's to celebrate the park's one-year anniversary, and it's going to be paired with a light show um, on the Gar Building that Minefield puts together. It's really something to see, completely free. Uh, Sunday, July 22nd, Wanda Jackson at El Club. This was um, Andalisi's pick of the week. Uh, she's like the first lady of Rockabilly. Oh, you guys are hanging out now. You guys just no, call she told and all she of told us. us. <laughs> Were you not here? She told us. Do you not pay attention to our own show? Uh, it was when I, she called I in. I hardly listen when I talk. Mm-hmm. There's a re- what does Confucius say? There's a reason God gave you two ears and one mouth? Exactly. Listen more than you say. Uh, God Smack and Shine Down at DTE, also on the 22nd, and Radiohead at LCA. They haven't been in Detroit in no, like this, decades, right? This is well, been a while? No, they had been. They came uh, another time recently, but prior to that, they hadn't. I'll be honest, I never got this band. I know this is an Me uncool either. thing to say. They have a say. very loyal following. I know they do. People are hardcore. I just, it's never I'm kind of neutral. Thing. Yeah. Uh, Tuesday, July 24th, Stone Temple Pilots, Bush, and The Cult at Freedom Hill. Uh, So a little music news. Um, uh, One of these free concert nights is happening, uh, or series, I should say, in Dearborn. It's called Jazz on the Avenue. It's Old City Hall Park. It's Wednesday nights, 7 to 9 through August. Um, Along with that free concert at uh, Beacon Park, there's kind of a whole weekend of stuff. Friday night. They'll have that Sunset Sessions, which I've been to before. It's a it's a DJ um, in an Airstream tra- trailer. Although when I went, for some reason, they didn't have the trailer. But <laughs> So I was really bummed because that's supposed to be the key feature. But this Friday night, it's going to be a silent disco version. This is weird to me. I don't. I don't get this concept. What so you exp- get? This is just people put on their headphones and they dance in the park by yes. themselves. Well, with all the other people. Ex- so yeah, so you just, it's kind of like so, a different experience. So everybody's hearing the same music? Exactly. So yeah. why does it need to be silent then? Well, I think if there's other stuff going on in the park, you know, yes. then what, those the other people... the neighbors were complaining? <laughs> Here's what I like about this. This is like going to a concert, but you don't have to yell in somebody's ear to yeah. get to... You can just pay, hey, listen, take your headphones off yeah. and have a normal conversation. If, right. if I invited everybody <laughs> over to my house and said, we're having a silent dance party at my house, you'd be like, that's the lamest thing Well, because ever. it would be at your house. Right. And, and so the, This is it, this like is, a really cool part. And it would disturb no. your Airbnb guests. No, yes, right. No. <laughs> I mean, come on. <laughs> no. When you put it that way, it does sound kind of goofy, but whatever. <laughs> um, so vinyl sales are up 20% in the first half of 
2018, and we can thank Jack White. He's not here ever, but we can thank him. We can thank him. Did he buy them all? Well, no, he He made them. them, But um, so streaming is still king for sure. But there's still plenty of interest in the physical, actual vinyl records. So um, Jack White's third solo album, Boarding House Reach, is the year's top selling vinyl record. 37,000 copies so far this year. All right. 37,000 copies. It's not that many, but it's, it's not vinyl. That Seth, people aren't buying CDs. Either. They're not buying I, yeah. I, I realize that. It's big for vinyl in 2018. I it's big do for a remember, physical copy of an album. I do re- Who was it? NSYNC? I do remember when they sold like a million exactly. CDs in yeah, a day. Play, yeah. You know what I mean? But here's what's funny. I, um, other 2018 top sellers, I just found this really interesting. Kendrick Lamar's Damn. Okay, no question. Brilliant. Guardians of the Galaxy soundtrack. Interesting. Kind of niche. Still there. one of the not, top. Not seven. really. I mean, Guardians of the Galaxy was a bunch of hits. It, it was. was a bunch a, of that's true. And hits. if you want to hear a lot and one vinyl, uh, but Michael and, Jackson Thriller is still a top selling vinyl. I think I've mentioned this before. When Michael Jackson died, and I was a top forty night DJ, there were ten and twelve year olds calling in and requesting his songs nonstop oh, because yeah. it was the first time they've been exposed to Billy Jean and Thriller mm-hmm. and all those songs, and they're like, "Wow!" It's timeless, and they just yeah. held up so well over the years. Still, and then and Fleetwood Mac Rumors too, huh. also top seller. All right, coming up, uh, a restaurant critic who we spoke to recently put out a tough review and uh, take a little bit of heat for it. Yeah, we'll talk about it. The deep brief history lesson. All right, Becky and Jag, from time to time, we like to check in with one of our favorite local historians. She knows everything. Like, she's just got all these stories in her head. Oh, just a... One of our favorites. How about our favorite? I think the favorite. And the amazing thing is that she can just rattle them off. Like, it's amazing just to to watch her work. I'm talking about Bailey Sisoy Iskro of Detroit History Tours and the Detroit History Club. Bailey, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me, guys. Oh, we're excited to talk to you because there's some big stuff that's going on, uh, starting with this big fire that happened, which I, I, I'll be honest, I was not as affected as my co-host here because I don't know. I was crying. The history of the Bob Lowe Island Ferry. I was weeping. Ferry. Yeah. I'm right there with you, Becky. I grew up downriver and took that boat over um, to Bob Lowe, you know, multiple times every summer. And as I said last week, uh, my wife did not grow up here, but had family here. So as a kid, when she would come visit her family, she would ride the Boblo boat. So when it was happening, she looked at me and I said, why are you sad? You didn't grow up here. She said, but I've been on that boat. I've ridden it multiple times. Something special. Yeah. It was like the communal family home. So the Boblo boat actually has kind of a fascinating history. It started out with the Detroit Ferry Company, which in 1887 merged with the Windsor Ferry Company. They consolidated into the Detroit Windsor Ferry Company, and they started buying up land on Babalo. And they did it with the pure purpose of making a location for people to picnic and a dance hall and sort of creating a destination for their boats. They had 11 boats on the Great Lakes at the time, adding two more, the Columbia and the St. Clair which burned on July 6th, just uh, last week. Those boats ran a dedicated line between the city of Detroit, taking off from right where Hart Plaza is now kind of at the foot of Woodward, up the 18 miles to to Babalo Island. And, you know, the last run was in September of 1993. And I think we all have memories of being on that double-decker boat with 2,500 of your closest friends. (laughs) So how many of these are left? I mean, do we actually have some that are still there or was this it? The boats? Yeah. There are two still left, the Columbia and the St. Clair. St. Clair burned. Both are decommissioned. Both are, by all effects, gone. Uh, The Columbia was built in 1902. The St. Clair was built in 1910. And at the time that the St. Clair burned last week, it was the oldest passenger day liner left in America. So not something you take for overnight voyages, literally (laughs) meant for short little jaunts for picnics back in the forties and fifties. They would put bands on these boats and have big festive parties and they would theme them like luau's or like the South Pacific. And people would come to Detroit literally just to go on this boat for a five hour boat ride and party. Yeah. My girlfriend was going through the photos as they were posting them up afterwards, and she's like, yep, I've been there, I've been there, I remember that, I remember this. Mm-hmm. And, and I'm watching Becky nodding her head as you're speaking, Bailey, just you know, connecting with everything you're mentioning about this boat. Yeah, and just what it meant to just kind of have these adventures, especially when you're a little kid. You know, I don't think a whole lot of people grow up living in one place and then going to an island for their amusement park. Right, I yeah. mean, it was neat. It was really neat. Yeah. 
And yeah. everyone's favorite ride was the boat ride to get there. I mean, yeah. once you got there, you <laughs> yeah. had, you know, the nightmare and the falling star. The and swings. my favorite was a ride called, yeah, the moose and the sky streak. And I mean, in 1925, we had the largest dance hall in the world. And it was on Bobolo. Yes. And yeah. you took the Bobolo boat to get there to, to dance. It could accommodate a thousand couples on the dance floor. And, you know, that opened in 1913 and all the way to 1925, it was the biggest in the world. So it's this place that sort of has a different meaning for different generations. For me, it was the bumper boats. Do you remember the scooter boats? Oh, yes. Mm hmm. So why I'm did this? I'm pretty sure I still have back problems because of those. <laughs> probably, <laughs> probably, yeah. Why, why did this place cease to exist? I mean, why did they wind up closing down? Well, you know, it, it actually closed down once before. During the Great Depression, it closed for a year and a half. But entertainment options changed. Cedar Point and these big, giant roller coasters started pulling people away from the wooden, rickety rides and the bumper boats and sort of the more turn of the century carnival that that Bobolo was i think it um, didn't trafficking. capture the next generation it was like those people that had a fondness and kept going but it was you know it got kind of outdated so when spencer the intern started taking his mom to cedar point for mother's day forget about of, yeah well, that was really the well, downfall no, no, no. <laughs> Bobolo closed in 1991 i don't oh, think oh, spencer right. was around <laughs> well let me it's funny you just, with 91 93 you talk about you know closing down in the early 90s bailey for our younger listeners that don't remember Bobolo. It, that was a time where you could just bounce back and forth between the U.S. and Canada and like nobody cared, right? Oh, yeah. Like I was telling these guys, I, it was one of the first places I was allowed to go alone. And it was a foreign you know, country, with, technically yes, speaking. Yeah. Now, which seems crazy. I was probably 12 or 13, you know, that I could go with I, my friend alone to Babylon Island. It went from all you had to do was say, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm an American and give your address yep. to remember when we all got indignant when they asked us to start showing our driver's oh, licenses. Crazy. Like that yeah. was asking so much to travel mm -hmm. between countries. Yep. Wow. Yep. So let me ask you about something else that's in the news, because this is uh, over the last couple of days, the Grand Prix, which has been happening over in Belle Isle. And we interviewed them uh, this year before uh, this year's Grand Prix happened. There's some doubt about whether it's going to stay there on Belle Isle. Can you? Tell us a little bit about the history of the Grand Prix and, and the Belle Isle. Yeah, so the Belle Isle Grand Prix is not Detroit's first shot at racing. In fact, the race came to Detroit in the 80s, and it was a downtown race. It went along Jefferson Avenue. It went through the city streets. But that was back when it was Formula One. And they ran into some snags in uh, 89 trying to get the race put onto Belle Isle and the city said no you know there was negotiation and the city said look you can do it in downtown but you can't take over one of the most used parks in the city of Detroit during the height of the park season for what we know will be several months no deal and so the race left so I understand at that Phoenix. point what was the condition that Belle Isle was in I mean is it in the same condition that it is now I mean was it always quite so beautiful or you know, it, it's never going to be as beautiful as it was in 1915, but it was used and it was accessed and it was family reunions and barbecues and swimming in the river. So there was a lot of uh, fear about letting the island kind of go to this race in 89. So they left and went to Phoenix and it took a couple of years. It took until 92 for them to come back. And again, it was a downtown street race until they got the deal to move out to Belle Isle in 2012. And the Belle, Belle Isle's big. I mean, it's 982 square acres. But in that massive amount of land, you've got a golf course. You've got putting greens. You've got the <laughs> Detroit Yacht Club, the Detroit Boat Club. You've got the Belle Isle Casino. It is an arboretum full of birds and plant life and all of these things that matter to Detroiters. And the race does take over about a third of the island. It restricts traffic and it changes traffic direction for between 12 and 14 weeks a year. And unfortunately, that is sort of the April to July time frame. As the city is getting more popular, we're seeing more and more people move into Detroit. We're actually seeing this summer them shut the Michigan State Police shut the island to traffic. So it brings up questions about what the economic impact is of the race. Is it valuable to have on the island? Is it making money? Um, you know, put on by Penske, a local company, how does it and does it affect the city in a way that it's worth renewing a pretty lucrative contract? So I have a question um, here. Uh, 
is it valuable to the city? Does it put on a race that you know? Well, they is just worth they it? just they just changed their bid from two hundred thousand a year to three hundred thousand a year, plus all the spectators. I would think it would be worth it to the city to keep it, right, Bailey? Um, so my opinion actually is that it needs to go back to a road race, one week set up, one week tear down. If Monaco can do it, we can do it. Roger Penske runs a logistics company. Figure it out. <laughs> you want that island? If you want Belle Isle, I've got no problem with them having Belle Isle for three to four weeks. But I do see an issue with a private company taking over a city-owned, state-managed park at the bargain basement rate of three hundred thousand uh, dollars for four true. months of summer. Well, well, the other thing, Bailey, is in the new offer too. Is so originally the setup took ninety-five days. Now it takes sixty-five. Under the new deal, it'd be thir- a thirty-nine day load in and twenty day load out. So that's so that's I guess eight weeks total. Is that still too much in your eyes? So let me ask you this way: If you have a backyard that you look forward to spending summer in all year. And for people who live in apartment buildings, Belle Isle is their backyard. For Detroiters, that is our backyard, just like the Bobolo boat was our home. If someone came to you and said, hey, I want 80 days of the most popular time you want to use your backyard, can I have it? I think it's too much. If you mow the lawn, I'm okay with that. <laughs> but it, I but, do think it's great, though, and I think it's great to have motor racing in Detroit. I just think we can do a better job of it. So you think if they did it on Jefferson or did it downtown, that they could actually have a smaller load in and load out time in and out in a week, and, and it'd be worth it for the disruption downtown in the summertime for a week like that? I'm just trying to see where you're coming from on this. I do. I think So I think the highlight of having this race is seeing Detroit in the news in a positive light with spectators and sport. I think that's phenomenal. I think what better way to do it than to showcase the architecture of the city. And I think doing it in the city forces them to make a timeline because there's going to be big businesses saying, Hey, 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 you're in the way you got to move, get it set up, get it torn down just for some historical context though. It's the longest setup and tear down in motorsports, even under the new terms. Huh? Oh, that's compelling. Wow. Is it just because it's a, a, because it's a park like Belle Isle or is it, or is there another unique factor that drives that? Do you know? You know, I, I don't know. Um, and I don't want to speak out of turn, but my concern has always been when nobody wants to dance with you, you dance with anyone. And my worry is that the city of Detroit gave up a very, very lucrative contract cheaply because nobody else wanted to dance with us. Ah. Right now, we've got far too many things and far too many citizens who should be our number one concern to let a motor race take over the island for that long. Mm -hmm. But that being said, I love car racing, and I got to do a hot lap this year, so I'm not complaining. I I did that, too. That was a lot of fun. I almost got car sick, but that's another story altogether. (laughs) See, I like. Keith, just, there's got to be a better way. I like Keith Crane's idea. I heard he wants to turn it into a bike race. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that would right. be very Detroit of us. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, Bailey. I know that you've got something going on. Tell us a little bit about the Better Bar Hop. What are you doing? So we've got a new tour that we're really excited about. It's actually led by a team of three amazing guides, and what they do is they take you to four of the oldest bars in Detroit. Halfway through, you stop and have dinner prepared by a local grandma or grandpa. Uh, huh. It's a eat it. It's good for you kind of menu. One choice, no accommodations. Just uh-huh. eat this. It's good for you, and go back <laughs> out and have fun. Yeah, it's oh, full of fun. history, fun facts, and prohibition, and drinks, and prohibition and drinks. Ball. Right? Yes, it's, it's full of prohibition drinks. and drinks. This whiskey's good so for many you. Drinks. <laughs> awesome. How do people get tickets if they want to? Where can people find all the info? You can get all the information at DetroitHistoryTours.com under the Tour tab. And there's two versions, the Better Bar Hop West and the Better Bar Hop East. Uh, Four different bars on each tour. Good time on both. All right, Bailey. Well, thank you so much for uh, checking in with us. We always love hearing what you have to say. It's fascinating. Always, yes. I learn stuff every time I talk to you. So thank you so much. Thanks again, guys. And I'll see you soon. The Debrief. Your guide to Detroit's arts and entertainment scene. This is the D. Brief. All right, Becky, let's talk about what's happening with food and drink. Sure thing. So the Village's Beer Garden, they're on Van Dyke and West Village. Uh, they've had this great selection, beer and wine, food pop-ups, music. I happened to actually go there on Sunday. Um, one of the cool elements of it is they always donate a portion to local causes and nonprofits. Mm-hmm. So I love this, too. It kind of con- combines with sports. Um, so this 
weekend and the next weekend, the beneficiary is Detroit Roller Derby All Stars. Nice. Yeah. Oh, I love Detroit Roller Derby. I know. I've been to a so game cool. over at the Masonic Temple. And- so, guess what? They are going to Spain Labor Day weekend to compete in the WFTDA Division One playoffs. Yeah. International playoffs. I mean, How do you say Roller Derby in Spanish? Um, I'm not sure. I'll get roller, back to you roller on derby that. Roller Derby-o. I'll get back but to you. But Detroit Roller Derby is serious. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, it is And there's some amazing hardcore. women. And so this will help cover their costs. So some skaters will be there to mix and mingle with the guests. You can meet some. They'll be selling t-shirts. and. Several months ago, we interviewed Lauren Uhalik on the podcast oh, yeah. to talk about Roller Derby. And, and she was amazing. And we'll probably talk to her again because she's also the woman who puts together the uh, Motor City Comedy Festival. Oh, sure. That's yeah. coming up this All fall. All crossover. So yeah. there's also a picture of the Village's Beer Garden on our Instagram. Instagram. So go there for a link to get to the get to the uh, location. Uh, the Czech and Slovak festival is going on this weekend, the 21st and 22nd. It's hosted by the Sokol Cultural Center. Uh, it's going to be in Dearborn Heights. Ethnic food, drinks, music, dancing. It's only five bucks and free for kids. Uh, the Detroit Institute of Bagels there on Michigan Avenue in Corktown was named among the best in America. So it's on a thrill list. I think there's 11 or 12 bagel shops um, and it's it's qualified outside of New York. So these are the best bagel shops outside but of New York. But that's because, but, they, but they're good because they boil the, they boil the bagel. Yes, that's boil what then bake. Good. So what is that's that, the thing. What does that do to the texture makes of the bagel? It makes it chewier. Oh, I, yeah, I, yeah, I like So it's like chewy bagels. on the inside, a little crisp on the outside. I like my, yeah, I like my bagels like I like my chocolate chip cookies, you know? Like, oh, like yeah. Warm and soft inside, but the you little, want them a little crispy texture on the out. Yeah. So this is a cool story too, because um, Detroit Bagel, Detroit Institute of Bagel, started off in an apartment kitchen. I mean, they were just boiling these in their in their small kitchen. It's family run. Run to the dishwasher. Yeah, there you go. It's family run. They're handmade. Um, so check it out. Plus they got... Washing machine when you get bigger. You know, you just throw them in there yeah, a little fits. bit of Tide. It's, it's good. <laughs> Eat the Tide pod on the side. No, that's bad. <laughs> Don't do that. Don't do that. Kids. So, you know, last week we talked about the 10 Streets That Changed America show on PBS. Yeah. Yes. So I saw that. That was great. Um, check it out. And right after that aired, another show aired that highlighted Detroit. Detroit. So it's called um, No Passport Required. And it's um, a story. It's the focus is on immigrant cultures in America, specifically about their food, but culture and history. So the premiere episode was about Middle Eastern community here in Detroit. Great. Yeah. And so the host is Marcus Samuelson. He's a chef and restaurateur, Ethiopian born, raised in Sweden. So perfect one to host a show like this. <laughs> and his quote was, what would America be without all the immigrants? Not as tasty. So he took people around um, all the Middle Eastern food restaurants, including Lebanese, Syrian, Iraqi, different origin, focusing in on Dearborn, Detroit, Birmingham. So this one I have on my DVR. I haven't watched it yet, but sounds like it was really great. It's always struck me that food is one of those areas where, you know, when you have strife along racial lines, you don't see it along food. Exactly. And, and, yeah. and food brings people, people together. It, it absolutely mm-hmm. does. And, and you know, there is such a thing as food diplomacy as, as actually building bridges yes. through food. Yes. You know? Yes. Um, so check that out. Um so we've talked about Como's in Ferndale <laughs> yes, there have. on the corner of Nine Mile and Woodward and that there's a new owner and they have, you know, decided to keep the name. So they're doing a riff on it. Uh, they won't be open, reopened until 2019, but they're doing a patio bar pop-up called FOMO's. <laughs> so of course, fear of missing out. Um rhymes with Como. So this Peas and Carrots Hospitality is hosting these. It starts Friday, August 3rd, and will continue uh, throughout the summer, Thursdays, Fridays, and Saturdays. So they're going to have it all decked out with like kitschy decor, games, music, cocktails and beer, but no food. I actually, that's actually <laughs> where I parked when I went to Pig and Whiskey in Ferndale this oh, weekend, right there. and I saw they had signs uh, promoting FOMO. Yeah, right outside FOMO, so, so I'm like, eh, we'll are the rats see. still here? Or are they? We'll yeah, see. Okay. Um, I wanted to make a correction. So a story I did last week, I just made a boo and forgot to actually tell you the name of it. So I talked about the local woman-owned food truck, Mexican food, that'll be on the Canadian TV show. I just wanted to highlight that it's called Regina's Food Truck. All right. And again, check our social media for details on that. Regina's Food Truck all around town. Opening this month, a new little restaurant, Spread Deli and Coffee House in Midtown, it's um it's going to be on chaos. Sandwiches made with Avalon bread and all the fillings, the meats and cheeses will be sourced from Eastern Market. They're going to serve Cadillac coffee, sweets from Detroit Cookie Company. Here's the cool twist. For every sandwich is sold, the partners plan to serve one free sandwich to people in need. Very cool. 
Yeah, so look out for that. So, a um, little controversy this week with our um, friend of the pod, Mark Kurlianchek, the Detroit Free Press restaurant critic. Um, he has been kind of known in the past for doing pretty rosy reviews right. of most restaurants. He that talked he about covers. that a little bit with us when he yeah, was he here. Yeah, he did. He did. And I think he's gotten some comments from the community about, hey, you know, they can't all be great. Keep it real. Yeah, keep it real. So he did in a big way this <laughs> recently. He reviewed Empire Kitchen and Cocktails. So they're in, um, in Brush Park there, right in the building where the Scott luxury apartments are. Mm-hmm. And kind of billed as an American bistro neighborhood place. Um, Mark called it banal to the bone. That's, I, and that's a word, I, I don't know what that word means. That's banal like cliche, is like right? so vanilla. Okay. Like, yeah, cliche, boring, bland, nothing unique about it. So he did a pretty scathing review. And, um, you know, the owner came back as like, I don't think that was fair, mm-hmm. you know? You know what this reminds me of? You remember a few years back uh, when... Um uh, Guy Fieri had that restaurant in Times Square, and there was this scathing review that just yeah, went just... viral. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and, you know, I mean, it was amusing to read at the time, but it's also, it, it, it was a little nasty. And look, mm-hmm. if, you're, if you're Mark, it's a fine line you got to walk, because we, talk, we sure. talked about this earlier in this age where everybody is a keyboard jockey and is not afraid to say really nasty things. But if you're a food critic, you've got to be critical when a place is not up to par. Right. I, I will say this, you know, having worked in radio. And, and you know this as well. That yes. Sometimes you are there in that studio in those four walls <laughs> and you're talking. And, and sometimes you feel like you're alone. You're alone. Yeah. You can and just you say whatever. Yeah. You're talking to your friends. And yeah. in order to get a reaction, you actually push the envelope further because you want some sort of feedback. And I could see how, yeah. you know, it's the same way if you're working at a and I, I, I'm not, And I'm not saying Mark did here, but I can definitely think of times where to get a reaction, I went w- way past the line and should not have and regretted it. Or... You know, overcorrected. Felt like you were, you know, which, which may be what happened here too. I mean, if, if yeah. there was a lot of, hey, you're you're being too nice, maybe you know, yeah. Or maybe I kind of read it too as almost like making an example of, yeah. you know, maybe this place is pretty mediocre, or maybe it's not. I don't know. I haven't been there. None of us have eaten there. But maybe I think the tone of it was about, hey, if this is the future of Detroit restaurants, it's too cookie cutter. Well, we did talk about Fist of Curry, which was closing. And, yeah. and you know, whether that was too far ahead of its time because it was too right. adventurous and too different and too not vanilla. Not, and yeah. then maybe the market wasn't ready to handle So this is like approachable. That. So I can kind of see, you know, where they're both coming from. But it was a big, big food story this week. This is the D. Detroit. This is the D. Breathe. All right, guys, another show. All done. It's Aww. over. <laughs> I know. Makes me sad. Want to say thank you to our guests, of course, Robin Axelrod and Sarah Saltzman of the Holocaust Memorial Center in Farmington Hills. Go. Just, just go. Yeah, very thoughtful interview as well. Uh, Bailey Sisoy Isgro of Detroit History Tours. We love having her on. She knows everything. She, and she makes it fun. Mm-hmm. Uh, don't forget, this Thursday, we've got Aaron Foley, the city's chief storyteller. We're going to talk to him. That guy has a long list of accomplishments under his belt, and he's a young dude. Yeah, he, so, yeah exactly. Uh, a lot of yeah. stories. The, the book I absolutely recommend. I read it when I first got here. How yep. to live in Detroit without being a jackass, and that's just one of his books. Uh, so we'll talk to him about everything that he's done and how he sees the city because the city is changing. And we're going to ask him how we cannot be jackasses. Yes. Exactly, because we need help with that. We do. Don't forget, you can listen to this podcast on Amazon. All you have to do is say Alexa, enable the debrief podcast. We've got a mobile app. You can download the app and listen to the podcast there. And of course, you can find it wherever you find your favorite podcast, whether it's Spotify, Apple Podcast. Google now has a podcast player. You name it, Finally. you can find it. Please, please, please leave a review. That helps other people find the show. It is the highest compliment you can pay to us. Please, please. Or you could tell a friend about the podcast. All right. We will talk to you guys on Thursday. Until then, see ya. The D Brief. Your guide to Detroit's arts and entertainment scene.